Welcome everyone to the Chat Mode Insight Series where we share best practices, information and insights around chatbots, voice and AI in the Microsoft ecosystem. Today, we are very privileged to have Derek Russell of Microsoft. Derek is the Data and AI Senior Specialist. On that note, welcome to the podcast, Derek. Chad, hey everyone. Thanks for, for uh, joining in. This is really fun and the first time that, uh, or second time that I'm not actually preparing the uh, the show. So that's, that's really cool. <laughs> Absolutely. And then I know that, uh, I think you had mentioned before we jumped on here, your role has shifted as of today as well. Yeah, so you caught me on a good note. I know we changed the the timing of, of the discussion several times because of election, then we had a holiday come up. But as of today, I am actually changing roles into a from a data and AI specialist in Microsoft's manufacturing enterprise operating unit into a digital advisor in our retail food and CPG business. So really excited about that. I'm still going to be covering a like for like type of technology set with the additional breadth of the Microsoft platform from devices all the way to HoloLens into applications and infrastructure, everything included. So really, really excited about that. Congratulations. And, uh, you know, that sounds super exciting. You get to essentially parlay a lot of the AI and data stuff and then just really expand that across, you know, different Microsoft customers. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of transformation going on today. Um, but before we jump into sort of the more, you know, AI and sort of sales oriented questions, um, I always like to ask a unique question. Uh, before we jump into those. So my question for you, you know, as a fellow podcaster, one that actually runs two additional podcasts, um, what is the most valuable insight that you've taken away? I don't mean to put you on spot, but, you know, I'm sure you've heard a lot of different insights, but um, perhaps just a recent one, you know, a, a recent learning that you found really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have two uh, that I'll kind of spin out quickly. Uh, one was from the principal data scientist at iRobot, Brandon Rohrer, and he loves solving problems. And his entire approach around problems is to enjoy the confusion and be okay with the feeling of being lost and not having shame or guilt for not being smart enough at the moment to solve that particular problem. And I'm constantly feeling confused and in, in a world of technology and, and lost and shameful because I don't know the answer. And his peaceful share of that was just amazing to me. And it's kind of changed the way I've been thinking about things. And then we also interviewed uh, the CEO and founder of Royby Robot, which is a, uh, a three-year-old three child and up AI robot toy, learning toy. And I asked her for some advice about what parents should be doing, not only in a COVID world, but extensively and externally beyond to better educate our children um, and she said, you know, just really understanding what they're interested in and giving them more unique opportunities to understand what they enjoy. So those two pieces of, of advice and insight were just monumental for me this year. That's incredible. Um, you know, I think it's so crazy to begin to see how AI is just like touching every single part of our world, you know, from, you know, 80 year olds that for the first time are utilizing something like Amazon Alexa, you know, to children that are using robots to, you know, facilitate education and learning. I think it's, it's very cool stuff. Um, so I appreciate you sharing those things. Um, and, and my apologies, I actually had missed the first thing because my AirPods conveniently decided to go out during that first part. So my apologies about that there. But, uh, you know, jumping into, um, you know, essentially your role at Microsoft, you know, historically and now sort of moving into the new role here, can you sort of give us a little context to, you know, how are you interacting with customers on the front line? And, you know, from that, you know, what are they, what are they talking about when it comes to AI? Yeah, so I, I was in the data and AI space in the, in the vertical space for about three, a little over three and a half years at Microsoft. And from a technology perspective and from a skilling certification perspective, I was more of a business strategist, have a business background. I don't have a technology background. So if I needed to qualify certain opportunities and bring really sharp people in different areas to the table based upon the use cases, based upon the customer interest, based upon the impact that we would have with our customers and their organizations, that's that mediation is what I would be involved with. And everything involving how data is ingested, where it's stored, how it's reasoned against with AI and machine learning, which I'm sure we'll get into a little more in this discussion later. And then how you make sense of that, the reasoning with 
BI tools, so Power BI, Click, all those different things that people use today. What does that entire data journey look like? And holistically, that's how I would manage um, my impact with the customers. In, in every type of customer from manufacturing, the, the manufacturing vertical, which is net new for Microsoft, which I'm now leaving that organization and going into a, the retail CBG food, um, all the way to high tech um, and, and software, um, engineering, massive engineering organizations. And believe it or not, a lot of these organizations have a lot of the same problems. Um, and if they don't have the same problems, they're still organ massive organizations. So the same framework and the same approach, the same type of empathy uh, was used and needed to kind of understand what those problems look like. So that that's t that's kind of what I was doing in that role and, and what others do in that role today. No, absolutely. I think, um, you know, specifically being able to identify the business mechanisms and drivers in conjunction with how AI actually impacts the workplace for across, you know, a multitude of verticals, I think is something that is probably just as important as understanding the technical side, you know, and I think it's a pleasure that, you know, we get a chance to talk about that today, Derek. So specifically, you know, in some of the verticals that you had covered, um, can you talk a little bit about some of those trends that you had seen? So from manufacturing to sort of industrial, and you said sort of highly technical engineering projects, um, what are those sort of AI trends that you've been seeing over the past couple of years? Yeah, sure. So when you think about what that particular business does, they're either oriented around projects or people or technology. And when talking to very, very technology intensive businesses like um, uh, ISVs or even system integrators or any type of, of technology business, inherently they are very good with advanced statistics and math and, and machine learning and AI. And a lot of these things are built within their processes. So there's already a lot of that know-how and business juice, if you want to call it that, for understanding what novel technologies and the reasoning against certain data can do for them. So the approach for those types of business was very, businesses was very different um, and they move so very fast as well. Um, but when you think about like an engine, like a large engineering business, or like an architectural engineering business or, or businesses that are building airports or, or infrastructure, or you think about even companies that are building hardware for customers, there's a lot of QA, QC, there's a lot of people orienting around hardware and infrastructure and physical spaces. So there's the need to not only you have a customer that's purchasing these different things and, and utilizing these services and in, in, in spaces and infrastructures, um, and you also have um, these physical assets. So there's there's a need to understand the customer and understand how they would like to buy. So there's supply chain opportunities in there as well. But there's also this, how do we understand the hardware, the asset, the physical infrastructure as well? So all of these things can be data-driven, but when things like customers and, and infrastructure come into play, then you have things like custom vision, facial recognition. You have uh, certain AI capabilities that some of these businesses just need out of the box to understand all these different things. You, if you have a manufacturer and they're manufacturing semiconductors, for instance, um, there's something called first article inspection, where there's specific inspection processes that once an item gets inspected, certain pieces get added to that to that 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 uh, hardware piece along the the supply chain or along the uh, the um, uh, the the events where this product is coming together. And if you don't catch those issues very quickly, then it can be very expensive because then you have to take this very complicated piece apart and reinspect it. But things like vision can look at that in real time and understand, what looks wrong, what doesn't look right with high probability. So there's all these areas based upon the business problem that you can start injecting ideas of how to pull out additional insights that human beings just simply can't do because we we fatigue or we just don't have the 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 you know the ability to consume all of this data and make sense of it. Absolutely. So that's that's a really really interesting thing. I think you pointed out. You know, as I was hearing you sort of describe that. You know, it's almost like on. You know, with some customers, they are su super fast. They're already using the technology, and they already know how to apply it, right? 
But then conversely, would you also say there are some customers and industries that you've worked with where, you know, maybe the maturity for them adopting, you know, AI, you know, is sort of nascent, right? And they're just trying to figure out what's the first step for us. Have you sort of seen that sort of compare and contrast in the sectors that you've worked in? Or would you say it leans to one side or the other? I think I think there's a little bit of both. I think if you're if you're the way that you pay or create value to your shareholders is managing massive projects. You, the people that you inherently have within your company, the value that you add is you know engineers and program managers and project managers. They're not specifically very hardcore software oriented people. Maybe you have an IT department. Many, maybe many times you may, um, uh, you know, have get, get your IT capabilities supplied by a large system integrator like an IBM or something of that sort. So, when you think about inherently the types of problems that these companies are trying to solve, the closer those problems are to technology and to software, the easier and the more, uh, I guess clear the path is to get them to understand what the, the more novel technologies can do for them, like the AI, like the machine learning and, and, type, and things of that nature. Because we, we, you can't have those conversations with IT. Those are not IT conversations, they're, they're business conversations. So you start thinking to yourself, what types of businesses have the ability to understand and are at the top of the maturity curve for understanding their data um, knowing what data warehousing is, you know, stream versus batch, um, you know, real time data understanding and insights and BI and all these different things. Because if your organization is not understanding those things from a business perspective, then you really have to start further down the maturity curve with things like, you know, SaaS applications or point and click, uh, a point and click type of um, capabilities. Um, you, you see that kind of stuff with Dynamics or Salesforce or some of these other applications that you see in these big businesses. But that that's kind of how I personally look at it. You know, how close to technology is this business um, and how can we get them there? How fast can we get them there? Yeah, I think that's a great way to sort of articulate that. You know, so it, from what you said, it sounds like, you know, there's certainly a continuum of companies at different stages of that maturity life cycle. You know, some of them are super far at the end of the spectrum that, you know, get it, you know, and they have a multitude of different stakeholders in there, those that are close to IT, those that are close to the actual business pain point itself. And then on the other side of the spectrum, it sounds like there's some people just getting their feet wet, you know, and, and for you as the consultant going in there, looking to identify those different stakeholders and sort of pull them to the table so you can have the right discussions. Um, you know, so I find that really interesting. So especially with the organizations that are a little bit more nascent, um, because I had read a statistic that said, you know, uh, AI penetration for traditional industries is only at 10% today, which to me is just, you know, an, an immense opportunity and also uh, at the same time a challenge, right? So for those organizations that are a little less mature with AI, what's the general sentiment? you know, that you hear from them around AI? Like, are they concerned about how to implement it? You know, are they sort of, you know, or maybe they're really sold on it and they just want to hit the ground running. What's the the typical sentiment that you hear from the organizations that are a little bit less mature? I, I think that the answer is changing constantly. Because I think if you rewind this entire conversation back to four years ago, when I first joined Microsoft, bringing up the very idea of AI machine learning you were talking about something that was super cutting edge. Like that that was almost the point there was nothing but risk involved in those types of projects. So you really had to find people that were willing to take risks, that were willing to lose money, that were willing to put their, their, uh, their, um, their not their careers, but their reputations on the line with doing this new project and trying to inherit some new way of approaching problems. And I think if you fast forward to today, now it's something that everyone is comfortable talking about. So it's a completely different ecosystem when you're talking about technology today. And I think very much in that, in that, at that time, it was, we can solve this with AI. We can solve this with machine learning. Now, those aren't even, those aren't even components in the discussion. Now it's, tell us what, what type of problems that you have, because most likely we've solved it. And we've probably solved it by these following use cases that just so happen to use AI and ML, but it's nothing 
glamorous because it can be done. These items are in production. This technology has been vetted. This is proven. There's no more risk in this. The only risk is the type of data that you have, the type of investment and resources and budget that you have, and your time horizon. When is the fastest or the, the, the minimum amount of time that you need to actually receive value from this project? So I think those things have changed tremendously, which is good because now we can actually come in and, and not talk about the technology because that's not fascinating. It's, the technology is, is changing too fast to be fascinating. What's fascinating is what kind of problems that we can solve. So I think that inherently going back to your some of your it, it initial anecdotes are what we're really focusing on in, in those different areas. Absolutely. Um, I, I totally agree. You know, I think the applicability of technology is far more fascinating than, you know, looking at it and being super enamored by how interesting the tech is. Um, you know, so I think it's encouraging to hear you say, you know, like, hey, four years on, we're talking about use cases here, right? You yeah. know, so, you know, I think a perfect segue for, for what we're talking about here is let's maybe just start talking about what's that process, right? So I, I think the first thing I heard you say, you know, earlier on in the conversation was, you know, we want to be, you know, as close to the problem, right? As close to the people that sort of understand what that problem is. And I think that makes a whole lot of sense. And I would imagine that's probably maybe the first step, identifying those stakeholders within that organization where you can talk to and, and they're a subject matter expert on that problem. Um, so if you don't mind walking us through, you know, a couple of steps on, you know, how do you identify that use case when you talk to these customers? You know, uh, and that's, I love, I love this conversation. I mean, it's, it, there's so much here to it because it not only is applicable to partners and engineering companies and folks that are trying to sell into these larger organizations, but it's applicable to these large organizations and how they're solving their own problems. Because inherently we're all in, in some type of advocacy mode. You're trying to advocate ideas for the purposes and incentives of your organization, or you're trying to advocate ideas for the purposes of your department or segment of the organization, if you're in marketing or sales or whatever. And the first thing is just understanding what the problem is. Um, if I don't understand the organization, I read 10Ks. I know that sounds really, really technical, but it's not. The first three or four pages of any 10K will help you understand the strengths and weaknesses profile of that organization. So if, if you're cold and you don't understand what problems an organization has to solve, even if it's your own, I mean, there's, there's public filings, there's data that is available to start understanding from a CEO level, C-suite level, what those problems are. Uh, some of the problems may be, you know, uh, we don't we don't understand competition. We don't understand our customers deeply enough or our customer base is changing. Well, there's a use case there. How can we help them understand what that, that customer 360 vision could be, that evolving customer 360? How do we reach out to those customers? One of their strengths might be um, the intellectual horsepower of our sales force. So one of the, the, the high-tech manufacturing organizations I was working with, um, their, their competitive advantage was how smart their sales force was because then that sales force can then have really amazing conversations and impact with their end customers. So then from a strengths perspective, how do we bolster those strengths? How do we give those salespeople more data, more insights at their fingertips so they can be even more impactful to that end customer? So I think understanding the problem is super, super critical. Um, understanding the value that will be received from solving that problem and who will benefit from that that value, who, who will be incentivized by that value and how is that incentive, how does it weigh up against other incentives in the business? Right now, a lot of organizations are cutting all of their projects in, in, from a manufacturing perspective and probably from an engineering perspective, they're cutting everything that won't yield value in the next six months. So you see their spending decreasing by 50%. So no net new projects unless it could yield some kind of value in the next six months. So now we can only focus on use cases that will, will yield value in that six month time. You know, who is the technical sponsor for this? You need someone, you need people. You need people that can actually put time and effort into this problem. You need a business sponsor. You need someone that's gonna carry across, that understands the strategy of the business, not from just the technical side, but who is that business sponsor? 
And then, you know, what are your opportunities for putting this thing into production? A lot of businesses love science projects, um, whether it be political or to revamp their career or to be relevant in their organization. They love taking on these crazy new projects or maybe they're just or unorganized. You have to be organized. You have to understand that if you're going to put effort into this three to six month project, it needs to go not just be a pilot or not just be a proof of concept. Proof of concepts are gone. No one wants to work on those. They're not exciting. What's exciting is putting something into production in three to six months. So those types of things are things that I think are most important when you're trying to advocate some kind of a project that will be adapting or using novel technologies like AI and machine learning. Man. Now, I love that whole process. It's very systematic in nature. And just to sort of reiterate for people that are watching and, you know, I appreciate all the comments coming in. People are, you know, just saying great conversation. They love the conversation. So, you know, I, I think we're on the right track here um, talking about this stuff. You know, first off, you know, I like what you said. It's, it's almost this, the same way you evaluate equities, right? Do your fundamental research, you know, and you said, hey, I'm reading the, 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 uh, you're literally reading the uh, SEC filing filings of these organizations, not only to understand, you know, what are the, you know, potentially profit generators in the organization, which gives you some sort of an idea of, you know, what metrics do they care about, right? Or what directions are they heading or have they reported? So I, I think that's a great, you know, it's a great idea for doing pre-sales, right? Come to the meeting prepared, right? And then from there, I like how you're taking those findings and essentially you're doing like an impromptu SWOT analysis, right? With the yes. stakeholders in the room. And, you know, they're already, you know, um, resonating with what you're saying because, you know, you're talking about the uh, SEC filing and um, they're leading you in that direction, right? And then I think the other thing that you had alluded in this conversation previously was, understand the time horizon, right? Are we talking about six months? Are we talking about two years? What does that look like? And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, it's almost like the sort of macro trends right now provided with the pandemic and how it's really like squeezing budgets. You know, what you're saying is, especially in the manufacturing sector, you know, if, if you don't have something that's going to be value generating in six months, we don't, we're not interested. Right. So I think that's really imperative. Um, from there, I like what you said about, hey, find the champion, right? Who's going to be that executive um, sponsor, that executive champion that's going to help you sort of drive this thing forward? And then finally, how do you make this into reality, right? You know, and we're not talking about pilot programs anymore. Um, and, and I think that that part is fascinating. And I want to drill into that a little bit more. So do you mind sort of giving, you know, a little bit more context when you're saying, you know, hey, we've moved on from this sort of like innovation budget pilot program mentality. Um, what's that mentality you're seeing within organizations, you know, sort of around that concept? I think the majority of organizations understand and, and, and all the all the components that we're talking about, you know, understanding scope and, and um, commitment and time horizon and the problem. I think all of those things pour the bedrock of, for credibility. Like you have to have credibility when you come to the conversation. And one of the ways that you have that are all these different, all these different things. Because you don't have credibility if you haven't done this before. If if this is if this is a science project for you, it's a science project for the customer. And you you really have to understand the fine line of those different things. With that said, you know again, you know three, four, or five years ago there wasn't very much credibility. So you had to do a proof of concept. You had to prove that the concept could work, right? But today, that's just not the case. We, when you, all the different things that we're using, the facial detection on our phones, the, the multi-factor authentication, uh, when you get into an Uber, um, the AI running, which is on Azure AI, by the way, the AI running that the driver has to check in with before it's safe enough for him to log into the application and drive the car. All those things are in production. So when you go to a customer and you start talking to them about these capabilities and use cases that you've done before in the past, which I think is, I think it's critical to the conversation. This is kind of, these are the things that we've done and worked on. What's interesting to you? We think this is interesting based upon your problem sets. I think those things take away this energy around, we got to do a proof of concept. And for me and for the teams that I work with at Microsoft, it's great if you want to do a proof, but there's too many customers or too many opportunities where folks need to go. They need to do something now because the, the time is now they're going to be disrupted in the next year, 
18 months because of what's going on in the environment, political environment, all these different things. They need to get products off the ground. They need to capture more wallet share from specific customers. So the now is not to build out a non-exciting two-year path to production. It's to build something out fast. So the majority of my conversations focus there, not whether we can do it or not, but why we just need to do it, why we just need to start innovating. And another thing is you need to, you're going to have some failures. Um, I had a customer that wanted a model built in three weeks, uh, a model for predicting uh, product product decline. And, and there was some pricing mix and that is just not realistic because you need data sources. You need to understand the right data. There's data engineering in there. There's holidays. People are working half time. You know, people have kids at home. There's a lot going on right now. And that type of three week sprint is just not possible. So doing three week sprints like that in proofs where it could just evaporate if there's no specific critical mass reached, it just doesn't feel like a very good idea. So trying to help customers understand if we're going to do this together, there needs to be, we need to fail. We need to fail fast. We need to understand what, if, you know, what models are going to be used best for this specific problem or data set. If that's, if that's what you're looking for, what applications you need to tap into. Uh, Michael said something about there being data silos being a problem. Those data silos are going to come up. What if we don't know where the data is at? So all these different things start to come into, into play. But once you start, again, pouring that bedrock, you start building a pathway to being a more data centric organization that is ready for AI, data is the auction for AI, then that's how you start moving forward. And those are the type of businesses that we see being very, very successful. So we want to point them in the direction of let's do this. You know, if you're going to go to, you don't, you don't do a POC on going to the gym and losing weight and getting on a, on a diet. You need to change your life. And maybe the first four or five weeks don't work, you know, but you need to stick with it and you learn some things about your body. It's the same thing for how you approach, you know, your diet and, and your nutrition. We're, we're focusing on the diet and the nutrition of these different businesses. Um, so that's just the way that I look at it. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, that was a great way to sort of characterize all that. A lot to unpack here. So, you know, I want to start with a couple of points. You know, first of all, I like the fact that you brought up you know, these drivers, right? That one of the drivers is the fact that, hey, we already have the use cases that are going to be oftentimes aligned to these specific, you know, verticals or industries. So we're not talking about experiments oftentimes, right? So I think that's one really good incentive for these organizations, to, you know, to have a degree of validation and say, hey, you know, 20 or 30 other companies have walked this path before with this specific use case, and we've implemented it, right? And then secondly, I like what you said about, you know, this imperative to move now and not tomorrow, right? And, and I think we've begun to see this next generation of organizations that are predicated on data, AI, and automation and are leveraging it as a defensible moat, right? We take, you know, I know this is this is an example that we always use, right? But it's, it's Tesla, right? They own 90% of self-driving data. So when you're in that position, that market position, you're, you're five years ahead of the competition. So for organizations to be able to start thinking in that mentality, you know, I think is really important. You know, so I guess my question to sort of dive a bit deeper for you is how do we, number one, what is that strategy, AI strategy, you know, at just a basic level that we need to start convincing our customers to really embrace. Because I hear, I, I heard you sort of say it, you know, you, you said we need to prepare these organizations to be much more data driven, right? And I think the interesting thing is when we contrast AI strategy to, I guess, a traditional IT, IT procurement process, you know, it, it's, it's different. Right. You know, we're, we're typically not telling them, hey, fail fast with a traditional IT procurement process. But with an IT strategy, you know, it, it's there's a certain you know, methodology of thinking that a company needs to embrace to really be able to achieve those successes. So how would you sort of characterize AI strategy and how do you work with customers to, to get them to, you know, sort of embody these things? Yeah, that, that, that's a lot of uh, a lot of context there. And. You know, the one I love the Tesla example because I con I'm constantly talking about Tesla because it, A, they're the coolest company ever, and B, you can talk about their technology in so many different ways, right? The, the, the beauty of the product, all the way to 
what the product is doing. Um, one of the things that I've been very careful with is when customers approach us and say, hey, we have so much data. Like we have petabytes on petabytes of data. That actually gives me a lot of anxiety and fear and doubt just because that's like saying, hey, we have a warehouse of 55 gallon drums of fuel. Let's go, let's go build a new airport. You know, like there's data is an asset, but the ability to harness that data in the culture, the AI data culture of a, how to approach the data, understanding why it's valuable, understanding where it's, where it's at, how it's cataloged, how it's meta tagged, how it's looked upon when it's used, where it's used. Is it in hot storage, cold storage? Is it readily available? Are you getting rid of it? Is it accurate? There's so many different things embedded in the data culture. So Tesla is a data culture. You know, they, they it, it goes back to this idea of a, of digital, a digital feedback loop. They understand what it's like. Let's say they start, they had zero data today. Like all their data got erased. All they would have to do is get into one of their vehicles or get have their customers get in their vehicles and just start driving the things. Because now you have this flywheel, this digital feedback loop flywheel start to, to, to spark. Now you have a customer, you have a product, the product's feeding telemetry into the, their main you know, CPU or their data hub. That's feeding uh, information back to their sales engine, how, how designing the car, how they should be designing it, stopping it, breaking it. All these different things start to work together in this digital feedback loop. And that all comes from culture. They believe in that flywheel of, of data. They believe in that digital feedback loop. And if you can start to look at things from that perspective, then you can start to understand why data is important to you and why you should be harnessing it. So I think, I think those things are super important to consider. Um, and I know you had a tail end part of your question. What was the tail end question that you asked? I, I think you you sort of you pretty much covered it, but it was it was like, how do you how do you convince them to sort of begin to body embody this? Because you yeah. know, culture is is a very can be difficult, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, technology can be easier than culture sometimes. So like, how have you sort of seen you know? culture, you know, uh, rolled out so specifically around being more data driven and sort of AI positioned. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with this idea of credibility. And, you know, all the things we discussed, like coming to the table, understanding their problems, understand, but then understanding their organization. And um, in this new role I'm doing, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of exercises and training around how to build empathy, how to get closer to customers problems organizationally through design thinking and, and different org exercises and, and how to inherently understand those problems. But I think that's what you have to do. That's where we're going. It's this idea of empathy, you know, interviewing people, talking to multiple different parties, um, talking to all parties, being, you know, at, at Microsoft, I constantly tell our customers that we are the marriage therapist between IT and the business or OT because there's no fluidity there. And that fluidity is part of a culture challenge. So how do we come to the table or any, any person or any organization come to the table and create credibility, fluidity, transparency, integrity, empathy, all these different things? Because those types of things, I think, encourage a change in culture. Um, another node of credibility is a quick win. We consistently talk about quick wins. Like you need to show value ASAP. No one's excited about a two-year project. Like, you know, no one's enrolled for even two years anymore. So, and I've had I've been on two years, two-year projects, and it's like the most unfascinating thing in the world. So it's like, how can how can you build that credibility and help them get a quick win fast? And then help the organization if you're working with marketing, working with sales, working with operations, whatever. If you can take that quick win and then you can invest in it yourself, invest your own time in it your own effort together collaboratively as a partnership, then you sell that idea, you advocate that idea into the other parts of the organization. And I think that's the easiest and fast, it's not easy, it's, it's the fastest and truest way to try to change an organization's culture and, it, and we've done it many, many times. I think those are all great examples and I absolutely agree with you. You know, I think the the quick win, the low hanging fruit enables a lot of that validation and, you know, I think that really is the crux of AI transformation. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, let's not try to pick the most challenging problem, not because we can't 
technologically do it. It's because, you know, internally we don't have that culture to, you know, not only get people to sort of buy into it, but also the core competencies have to be on both sides of the fence, right? You know, as a consultancy, we can come in and build you something really fancy that works well, but someone's going to need to manage it. There's going to have to be some sort of extensibility in the future. So I think there's that function there too of also, you know, let's start on something small, right? Show the validation, get people to begin to build that core competency. So not only are they confident to evangelize it, but also they can start building some things in-house on their own with the tools we can provide them. So, you know, I, I absolutely agree with that sort of, you know, methodology. And I think more companies today, you know, should, should start to consider that, right? We, it, we can do low hanging fruit. It's this idea. And I, I love to call it low effort, high value, you know, and, and folks come to the table with all these ideas and like, oh my gosh, for knowledge mining, for instance, how can we understand different artifacts, PDF, Excel documents, data stores, all these different things in our, in our enterprise, where do we start? And I'm always like, what is the lowest effort highest value use case that you have. Let's start there. And every single time, only one idea comes back because it's it's very clear what that low effort, high value thing would be. If I want to score some, some points with my wife this weekend, like I know what the lowest effort, highest value things are I can do around the house. <laughs> That's just like, because those are, they're easy. They're, they're one or two things. Typically, you know, if you start working on those things, others will start to to see that what you're working on and also agree, yeah, that is low. We can do that. We can handle that. Credit, there's more credibility built there within that flywheel. So I think that very approach is, I think it's super important. And then secondly, just a quick thought. We interviewed the uh, director of intrapreneurship at the Microsoft Garage, Ed Essie. And uh, it, the Microsoft Garage is a program of change at Microsoft for innovation and innovating new ideas. And he wrote up this paper and it's in, this entire idea of what his team is doing on a global scale. And most corporations, when they focus on innovation, they focus on the fruit of some innovation, like some one hit wonder. We're going to have this one product and it's going to be awesome. And we're going to have X, Y, Z revenue yield from it. That doesn't work because you're only focusing on that one fruit. Others try to have this tree approach to innovation. So soil trees, fruit, they focus on the, the trees, you know, they, 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 create these, these, this momentum, they get some top-down leadership involvement, they create an SVP of innovation, they have some people involved, they're funding some of this stuff. But still, you're lacking that inclusive culture, you're lacking a, an, a, an organization-wide approach to how you bring the most brilliant minds together. And yeah, you may have a, a, a couple trees that yield some, some fruit that could be harvested once or twice, but what does it look like to actually create that soil? bringing in the best minds across the entire organization together in a diverse and inclusive kind of ecosystem where all ideas are good. All ideas can be compared against, and you're really having a more meritocratic view of, of the best products win. Um, so those types of things, I think, are really important. And it starts with innovation in terms of change management. Man, I think that that was, uh, that was awesome. Um, you know, so to just maybe summarize real quickly from what you said, you know, like I think a big part diversity, right? And I think there's so many levels to diversity. And, and I think it's great that more organizations are, you know, taking, you know, additive measures, like substantial, tangible ones, moving those things forward. And then I like what you said too, because it, it put an idea in my head, you know, we see some organizations begin to create these centers of excellence around artificial intelligence internally, right? So if we can sort of take those low effort, high value projects and take the learnings from there and put those in those, you know, sort of cross department, you know, uh, access to those resources. Now you got different people, different stakeholders thinking about this, you know, at the brightest mind. So I, I think that was a great point um, by you. Um, I wanna shift gears a little bit because I heard you say something um, specifically around you know, some low hanging fruit use cases, right? And, mm -hmm. and I heard you say data mining, you know, and, you know, I'm getting access to knowledge bases. So I wanted to segue a little bit to talking about how are you sort of seeing your existing customer base or existing industries right now begin to adapt, you know, chatbot solutions internally? Um, as I think the knowledge base one is just very popular right now. We're seeing it with our customers um, or even voice. Like, how are you sort of seeing that right now? 
Yeah, so we have been doing so much work around call center analytics, uh, real-time call center analytics, um, the, the changing the, the customer experience profile through chatbots. Um, as you know, we have our, our Azure bot framework. Um, uh, we have Power Virtual Agents, a number of different product suites that are beginning to merge together across the, the fabric of our, our ecosystem. But the use cases that we see the most are internal type like business optimization. You know, we have an IT department. There's an I, there's some kind of I. Someone needs help with something. Like I, just this morning, I needed some help from from FedEx, and I, I, FedEx is personally not. I just got a notification from them on my, my iWatch. They're not a customer of mine, but I tried to find out some information about a package, and I went in through their their website, and I used their chatbot and the chatbot experience. And this is my own, this is, I'm not speaking for Microsoft or speaking for any other, I'm speaking for myself my, as a customer. There's no, there's no I, way for me to communicate with with their systems or their ERP or their supply chain or their, none of that. The driver, it was, it was completely obsolete in terms of me having that communication profile. So a lot of our customers see that and they want something better. They want the customer to have complete transparency into their supply chain. If something, if material is being ordered from China for, for the, you know this these in this, these assets, we want to know the degradation of the steel. We want to know where it was it was it was it was bought from. We want to know where it's at in that supply chain. Um, so there's all these different. It's it's all about this idea of transparency. So I think the chatbot fits in that in that realm because it gives you that transparency, whether it be you having, you forgetting your badge at work and you just need to reset something or order a new badge and you can log in very quickly and communicate with that kind of bot. And that, that one bot can then be an orchestrator for other types of RPA or automation or things that reach into other different systems. But it's that ability to also understand the customer as well and understand the semantics of their language, so have some kind of language understanding so that we can communicate you know, with two thumbs. Um, on the go. So it's this omni-channel experience. It's this transparency into business processes. All these things are all wrapped in together. And the and the bot, it's, it's looked at as such a useless point of entry, but it's doing so much. You know, and people have been so focused on RPA, robotic process automation. And that that was really cool. But now you're having this AI powered artifact or entity that's able to understand you a lot better that can now go and trigger all these RPA calls and now can have access to all of your data systems, all your data silos, your ERP systems, all those different things can all be pulled into the centralized entity for you to communicate with. And I think those are the things that really light up the conversations. We had a conversation with a, a really amazing chip maker um, that was trying to understand, you know, they're trying to save money on all their IT people, like losing badges and having password issues. You can't have real people, you know, answering those types of questions. You need, that needs to be automated. I think Gartner said by 2020, 85% of organizations, their relationship with the customer would be via digital, via bot. So anytime there's some usage of people, persons or whatever, that's, clearly the best way and, and and that 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 use of people or persons is is committed to creating transparency that's the first place to light up a new opportunity to use ai to use app, to applications to use technology to completely rid the, the the static nature of that dilemma and have the human don't fire them we're not that like that the world of the terminator that, that doesn't exist what you can do now is have those people focus on their proprietary functions I know that was long-winded, but that th that's kind of the thought process across those different areas. No, absolutely. You know, I, I run into sort of some of the same conversations too. You know, it, it's almost as if, you know, when people look at automation technologies, sometimes they're looking at chatbots in this very monolithic perspective. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's sort of clunky and, and it's like, you know, hey, you know, if we sort of decouple what this bot is doing, it's, it integrates a lot of these existing technologies that you're probably already implementing, right? And the chatbot itself is just sort of like a, a mechanism to access these things, 
right? And automate these things more efficiently. Because I like what you said about integrating RPA into it. I think chatbots and RPA are just this perfect combination of things in addition to taking advantage of existing API endpoints, right? Because now you have this like ability to orchestrate powerful automation, you know, both externally, you know, as you were mentioning and internally within organizations, um, because you're right. There's a lot of use cases that don't really require, you know, a higher degree of, uh, of, of complexity right, or uh, excuse me, a higher degree of, um, or people shouldn't be spending their time is what I'm trying to say, you know, yeah. trying to process lost, you know, identification cards or passwords. If we can sort of lend those things off, you know, now you enable that person, not replace them to be, you know, 10X, you know, more effective, a force multiplier, you know, if you will. Um, so I think there's a whole lot of opportunity there. Um, I think maybe an interesting segue because, because you know, you, you started talking about, you know, almost your vision of the future here, right? You, you said, hey, you know, I want it to be fully transparent. It's going to be omni-channel. We're going to be integrating and sort of layering these technologies together. So, you know, for your personal opinion, like what, paint us a picture. Like what do you see as sort of the, the future when it comes to chatbots and voice and, and perhaps even, you know, other automation technologies? Yeah, that's a, it, I, I very, 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 uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't very often live in the future. It, it, with my current, it, in my current role. And that's only because the majority of businesses out there just aren't there. They are yeah. still, point. you know, their servers are still in data centers. They're still using very, very slow and legacy communication protocols. Like you get on call, like, you know, many of these customers don't have a, a, a teams. I love teams, obviously you don't have a teams or some type, some type of call platform where their data is integrated into it. There's AI integrated into it. We have bots in Teams. So if, for instance, there's a request that I, I needed to make uh, to our Microsoft Technology Center to have a showcase um, AI discussion with some leaders and one of our customers, I can create the appointment or the project or the application or whatever the, the request inside Teams and I'm done. There's no email, there's no, there's no um, additional like steps I need to make. It's talking to our CRM system, which is talking to our um, our scheduling systems. It's automatically pinging through flow and other types of triggering different groups that need to be added to this type of request. And then I auto automatically get an email. Like that future, I already live in today just because I work at Microsoft and we, we design productivity tools. So it's very easy to be in it. But when we talk to other customers, they're just they're just not there or they're getting there and it the current state for them is just amazing and they can't even imagine like a couple a couple steps beyond that so i think it's we're I'm, we're doing it we're having a discussion with a with a, a leader a sales leader on on wednesday i believe um, tomorrow and the whole conversation is going to be about this idea of do you understand who your customer is do you understand what they're doing do you understand what they're seeking? Do you understand how they're changing? You may say that you are, but unless you're talking to all, you know, it, whether it be Salesforce or, or Dynamics or whatever, unless you're talking to all of your CRM systems, you're talking to your ERP systems, you're, you're figuring out what is going on in your enterprise, you understand how much product is being sold in real time, you understand all the challenges of the business, all your employees understand all those different things. Unless all that stuff is touching and you have complete digital feedback and observability of those things, then you can't get to the future. And I think that is what the future is for us or is for the, a lot of these different customers. And it's not buying more technology. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about the current state of technology. All it is is you're consuming services that you can kill, you know, because of the cloud computing. You can spark up a service, load up a chat bot, write some code. If it doesn't work, you kill it. Um, so you're consuming these things on an OPEX schedule. You're not buying licenses that you're not going to use. So in, in the blink of an eye, you can have these things up and running. You can have all these systems talking to each other without buying more data warehouse products or putting more complexity into your system by just connecting things and looking at them and then driving insights. I think it's a very simple future. It's not a sexy future, but it's literally that's the future that we're trying to push our customers to. 
I mean, you know, I think simple is is valuable. Yeah. You know, I, I think you actually make a really valid point, right? It's like the simplicity of it, you know, both from consumption and just like shifting the mentality to have this iterative process, right? Where I can spin this thing up and if it doesn't work, we can spin it back down. And we didn't yeah. have to make this huge CapEx expenditure exactly. that, you know, we're gonna have to wait two to three years to see some sort of ROI on. So I, I think that's a really, really valid point. Um, you know, sort of thinking about what you had said, right? You know, present day, you know, can, can you maybe share a couple of, uh, you know, uh, recent case studies where, you know, you came in, you know, and identified a specific problem and maybe the outcome for the customer? I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. So without uh, giving up too much um, about the customer, I think a lot of businesses are focused. So Microsoft, we we have an approach to digital transformation and we, we dissect our approach into four distinct pillars. Um, it's, you know, changing away our customers or other organizations are engaging their customers, they're empowering their employees, they're optimi optimizing operations and they're transforming their products. So typically any problem that a, an organization is having, there is a solution across those four different digital transformation pillars. And the ones that I see that are really, really cool and are really changing the way things are being done at these organizations is the transformation of products. So, we came up with something called, and it, it's not, it, it's me, myself and some other folks on our team, uh, an innovation factory. So it's how we can bring new ideas to bear. And it's a very easy, it's literally on a one page PowerPoint and there's customer value and Microsoft value. And these things have to connect. And at the end, you're having this collaborative partnership. Where we're kind of going to market together and it starts from nothing. It starts from just having some ideas. So typically the last couple ideas that have been just phenomenal, we're just coming together, understanding some very visionary items and understanding some low, you know, low effort, high yield, high value items, and trying to figure out between the two organizations what was most important. In one case, it was a, it was a vision project where they wanted to do use vision to negate some super high labor, um, SME, um, cost of like looking at certain things for quality issues. So we, you know, we met with, with senior leadership on their side, had these different discussions. They gave us all these different ideas. We came back and said, let's go after low value, high or uh, low effort, high value. But in the end, we want it to be high value for Microsoft as well. That's how we kind of segmented into this one specific vision idea where there was tremendous amount of labor being used. We brought in a partner, we co-invested in that partner. Um, it took some time, we were very, very clear and very transparent with what we were trying to do. We solidified scope, time horizon was very, very transparent as well. We had line of sight to all the different business and technical sponsors on all sides. So now this is a three-side a three side party, you know, bringing in a system integrator as well. And the end result is we were able to create something that now the customer can then not only use, but they can then bring it into the Azure marketplace and they can now become an ISV provider. We're now taking an internal problem where they wanted to just displace the high cost of using SMEs to look at video footage to discover quality issues and, and things. And now we're able to build a solution that exists in the Azure marketplace that now the entire sales force at Microsoft can then sell into their customers if their customers wanted to use the same thing and this end customer now has this new product and now they're becoming this this technology company i think that type of scenario are the most fascinating scenarios that we get to work on and i think being at microsoft that's one of the reasons why i love working here we have that full scope and range of being able to do that because we don't we don't compete we don't sell diapers on an e-commerce website and we don't build autonomous cars you know we build really cool tech for companies that want to adopt and build really cool tech. Um, so that's just one example of, of something I've, I've been working on. Man, that's super exciting. Um, I, that model is just transformational, right? You're, you're maybe taking like a traditional, you know, within that specific department, it being a cost center. And now you're changing that into potentially a revenue generation channel for this organization. And I think that, I think just sort of speaks volumes in the, 
in, in this this like shift that's going on, right? We're moving from capex to opex in regards to how easy it is to spin these things up. You know, not only can we sort of apply, you know, the data, you know, automation and AI for that end customer, but also can sort of parlay that into a product or an ISV offering they could sell. I, I think that's just a huge opportunity to start to rethink how organizations are going to be competitive in the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years. So that's super exciting. You know, really appreciate you, you sharing with us um, that case there. Um, so I know we have about five minutes left. So what I always like to ask before I end these interviews is, um, you know, hey, we work in a very, you know, sometimes, you know, it's innovative. There's a lot of ambiguity around it. Um, you know, we so, we have to grapple with the unknown sometimes when we build these new projects, you know, with artificial intelligence and automation. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, Derek, what keeps you inspired? What keeps you motivated? I think, uh, and I, I have this podcast, I think, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned it yet on this, on this um, call, but the Data Binge podcast, and it's focused on interviews with technologists and practitioners in the world of technology and business and other areas for the sole purpose of understanding and creating better relationships with human beings and technology. I think it's so important to talk about AI and to talk about the context of AI to our personal lives, um, to talk about diversity and inclusion, to talk about why AI may or may not be good for educating our children in the case of the, of the robot we discussed earlier today. But to have those conversations are extremely important so that we're not building things that are going to be dangerous for our society or the technology is only in a subset of people's hands where they can build things that impact our society. So I think educating our youth, educating um, girls and educating Hispanics and African-Americans and all these and, and Asian-Americans and all these folks just specifically in our country, but also ex externally, how do we get them the tools, the Wi-Fi access, the curriculums, the, the Python and the C and all the different languages so that they can start building things on their own so that we can truly just democratize the power that these tools can make. I, I think that is so important for all of us to understand. And if we're if you're listening to this call, you're watching this call, you probably have all those skill sets and tools, but how do we spread those out to folks that just don't? Because it's just gonna be better for our world. Um, Absolutely. I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, you know, I think the notion that education, you know, could really power a lot of different change, but it's, it's only if, you know, we can sort of make sure that education and technology is in the hands of, you know, as many different people from different backgrounds and perspectives as possible. So, you know, I really appreciate that perspective, Derek. Um, thank you again for coming on the podcast here and sharing your insight, your expertise around, you know, how does, you know, an organization adapt AI? And what's the process around that? Um, so I appreciate you helping us sort of demystify that today. So um, thank you everyone who tuned in today and uh, really great comments, really engaged. I appreciate that. So on that note, um, you know, I'm just going to say thank you so much and um, looking forward for you guys tuning into the next one here. Take care, everyone. Thank you.